Hi, I'm Linz Derry, a researcher and principal at Metalab. When I was approached to prepare this video presentation and write a companion essay on the topic of narration and embodiment, I said yes, thinking what a fantastic topic to think about my prior work as a dancer on stage, touring around the world for more than a decade, and current research on choreographic interfaces in the design and humanities spaces. Not that I regretted that decision, but I did kick myself a little, thinking what am I going to actually talk or write about? I've never considered myself to be a narratively driven choreographer, but dances don't tell stories. They're not driven from stories. And my design work, though I create experiences for people, aren't necessarily creating structures to communicate narratives or to drop people um, into them per se. This challenged me to have to define narrative specifically for my work, not just for my dance work or um, performance work or for my design work, but I had to find a definition that could bridge between the two worlds. And this led me to the idea of a body narrative, which is in many ways independent from time or the dramaturgical constraint of time of having to have this beginning, middle and end. Thinking of a narrative non-linearly and more layered and nuanced also as something that's emergent and independent of direction from, say, a choreographer or a designer, um, I was able to find the connection. Difficult to explain off script, as you see right now, please forgive me. With that in mind, I am going to read my essay but I promise to keep it moving, to keep it entertaining, and to present it more as a visual essay with lots of great video footage along the way. Um, I'll see you on the other side. I have long admired abstract artists like Joseph Albers and Franz Klein, whose paintings I comprehend through my senses or sensuously, just as I do with the dances of Mars Cunningham. In the same way, when observing abstract movement, I am always cognizant of the dancers performing that movement as human beings. The Cunningham dancer's countenance that fails to belie her pleasure while performing stands as a constant reminder that there is always a human underlying the non-narrative performance. And although Albers and Klein's paintings are enshrined as motionless objects in museums, the paint strokes that had once been applied choreographically by the artists still vitalize the objects with a human essence. It's this humanness in abstract or quote, non-narrative art that prompts me to consider whether all art, especially performance, is in fact unarguably narrative. Regarding whether a performance can be absent of any personal narrative, I ask, can a performer ever disembody themselves as to purely communicate ideas without any personal connection to them? In other words, can the messiness of a performer's identities, embodied knowledge, and subjectivity ever be disentangled from their interpretation of choreography and experience of it while performing? I danced for 10 years for a Venezuelan Canadian choreographer, Jose Navas whose aesthetic lineage derived from Cunningham and Lucinda Childs. When rehearsing Navas's architectonic choreography in the studio, he would tell me, don't add commentary. Even if a performer can succeed at not adding their subjective commentary to a shape, for example, it may be impossible for a viewer to see anything but a dancer making a shape. Where there is a body, there is a story, especially for the observer. A narrative need not be contrived by the choreographer or acted out by the dancer for it to emerge 
important protagonist and all with plenty to say. This is because the body is an archive, a cultural mirror, and an agent in the perpetual story of life. A question posed by the temporal communities at Free Universität Berlin. How can non-linguistic modes of narration, such as materiality or affect, develop embodied knowledge? Indeed, the performative narratives considered here are non-linguistic, though I'd add that the movement vocabularies and grammars they give rise to can be described as semiotic and poetic, respectively. In addition to being non-linguistic, and despite how performance traverses time, they are also rather non-linear. From experience, I can attest that, while dancing, embodied memories, traumas, and training intermingle with presently felt affect and sensation, thus uncontrollably weaving the past and present together into the dance or emergent narrative. This process also gives rise to embodied knowledge that's historic yet current and transferable through the medium of performance. This embodied knowledge that's derived from dance praxis does not always transfer well beyond the mediums of technique, choreography, and performance, largely because it is tacit and not readily digitalized as such. Living in the information age where cultural discourse and archives are progressively networked online, this is problematic because, to use Free Universität Berlin's term, temporal communities are essentially precluded from this digital activity. Aware of this, my current research uses choreographic interfaces as a provocation and framework for bridging embodied and digital worlds. In particular, it grapples with the computational complexity and body politics inherent in the task of integrating choreographies into information systems return to the idea that where there is a body, there is a story. And considering that to digitalize embodied knowledge, bodies must be mediated, I ask. What personal narratives do our computers perceive? What stories are they inferring from our body's data as they mediate our daily choreographies? More broadly, as we use new media to transfer embodied knowledge, just as we've used stages for millennia, what new narratives will surface? Structurally in performance, personally for performers, and automatically for human and non-human observers. Controlling or suppressing narratives is hardly a successful strategy in politics, although such is often attempted. When considering latent body narratives, Control and suppression are revealed as futile approaches anyway, for these narratives are embodied, ever-present, bubbling up as human expression, both on and off cue. Stages and choreographic interfaces can help to transfer and archive these narratives and their knowledge forms across analog and digital domains. Rather than having a controlled societal narrative, we can use the ingenuity of the performing arts to have an integrated cultural one instead. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts on where there is a body, there is a story. As mentioned, I was excited to participate in this series as it would give me the opportunity to consider how my dance and design practices intersect around the theme of embodiment and narration. Having figured it out by honing in on the idea of tacit body narratives, I'm able to now reflect that my last solo work, Remote Body, and ongoing project, Second Look, really nailed this idea on the head. I created Remote Body in 2017 when living in the San Francisco suburbs. This was just prior to attending the Harvard Graduate School of Design. 
By then, I was already working as a solo artist for five years via my platform, Lens Dance, so I was spending quite a bit of alone time rehearsing in the studio, touring, and at home during the day when my partner was at work. I figured why not lean into this embodied experience of isolation that I was having and um, to go even deeper into the experience directly, I transformed my living room at the time into a dance studio and created the entire work from there. I then went on to premiere from living room to stage at Korea's International Modern Dance Festival. Second look is a data visualization project that uses AI to assess the gender and sentiment in paintings at the Harvard Art Museums. I was curious if the results of passing images of the portrait collection through commercial AI services could tell us anything about how artists portray gender and sentiment through time, how museums procure and curate paintings with gendered subjects, and really if AI is even a uh, legitimate resource for understanding such attributes in paintings. I now see how this was very much an investigation of our cultural engagement with tacit body narratives, specifically those um, that are embedded in others, embedded in the paintings, um, and through self-reflection are also the narratives of ourselves, right? Because at one point, AI is going to be um, assessing these attributes in us, not just in museums. That's all I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much. You've been fantastically attentive and I do hope to engage with you again. Thank you.